Good day, everybody. Welcome to The Deal Scout. On today's show, we're going to have a conversation about international investing and what's going on in the world here in the United States, but also maybe across the pond over in, in India. And uh, with that, we're going to have a friend come on and, and share his experience, his journey, and maybe where we should be putting some attention. So Ankit, welcome to the show. Thanks, Josh. Thanks for happy to be here on the call and on the podcast and share what we have learned. Awesome. All right. So let's start with this. Um, tell us a little bit about your journey getting into venture capital, now GP of a fund. So I want to hear all yeah. about that. But tell us about the journey of how you got there. No, absolutely. Um, I have been managing consultant throughout my life for 23 years. And now we have transitioned into private equity and venture capital. And it was a pivoting point or inflection point for me to think about what is next after consulting, where I identified after spending like almost a year to think as to what next in private equity and venture capital was the space where I was looking at where I can apply everything what I've learned in consulting, along with my management degree from Columbia, which helped me institute and do walk the talk of what we actually do. And this is where my uh, expertise in value creation, financial optimization, or strategic partnership, which I have built over the period of the last 20 plus years, comes to fruition of the companies which we are investing in, or we are acquiring to run after the acquisition is, is the journey in, in short what we have. And thus far, um, we have built a very strong team uh, of inventure, which is of global operators, government policy regulators, and um, subject matter experts who are ready to be a part of our team and helping us clean the deal or validate the deals which we should be going and investing in as we go forward from here. Um, and we are focusing on um, emerging technologies and technologies which are profitable in nature in the space of healthcare space and sustainability. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, in both US and India as a geographical sectors, which we're looking at it. Okay. Um, so that's about the journey thus far, which uh, we have reached in Inventure's life as we speak. And we, there are good days ahead and we are moving in a positive direction as we, uh, as we speak right now. Yeah. So describe the day that you, you know, doing management consulting, working with firms, healthcare industry, technology. And then one day you mm -hmm. said, I'm going to create a, a group and it's going to be a mixture between VC and PE. Mm -hmm. Right. So explain that. Cause that's a unique, a, a unique blend. Cause most of the time it's, I'm a venture capitalist. I'm looking to do this, or I'm a private equity group looking to acquire. You have mm -hmm. a unique model. I would like to hear about that. Absolutely. I think, uh, the word which you have used unique is definitely is what we are focusing on that it provides a continuum of investment which we do right from the early stages of the VC from pre-series A to series B. And then eventually at least 20 or 30% of our investment, we can underwrite and acquire those companies. So it provides a continuum of companies where we'll be investing in and our conviction on those companies that we can go after three years and do the underwriting to acquire those and run those and scale it. So the uniqueness comes into our due diligence and identification process of those companies where we are believing and putting our money in, and not only just putting the money, but we are working with the founders to scale it to a position where if I need to go and buy it, I can go and buy it. And hence, the two uh, strategies which we have implemented to provide that continuum and also the valuation which these companies uh, from early stages when they transition into PE can go into with the comfort and the confidence what we are bringing with these team and the subject matter expertise across the dimension of uh, investment uh, which we bring in uh, in the overall scheme of work as we go forward. Now, you, you guys decided to create this continuum, right? So you could get involved, pre-seed, maybe even up, you know, Series A, Series B. And that you could great. take an early stage company, grow a, my, a good amount of value. And then at one point, the PE side maybe comes in and, and acquires it and grows it out. That right? is correct. Exactly. That's the, that's the continuum which we're providing right from pre-Series A. That's where our investment starts. 
But at the same time, we get engaged with the companies which are in seed stage as well, because that allows us unique access to the founders, learning more about the team, the product. By the time they are ready for our investment in pre-series A, we know whether we'll be able to invest it or not. Mm -hmm. So pre-series A, where you have established your revenue, product market fit, founder fit, all those necks are already been addressed. And then we go and invest in it and then take it to the acquisition should there be a need. Uh, and we'll be more than happy to do that. So that's where our conviction and confidence, where we are investing in those companies which we are working with. Yeah. Now, when I look at business models or structures, venture mm -hmm. capital versus private equity, sometimes mm -hmm. there's a misalignment in value creation mm -hmm. and valuation, right? Mm -hmm. He's looking to come in and buy at a, you know, at a good value. So mm -hmm. is there a conflict of interest? Or I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. You're here. You are trying to mm -hmm. boost the value as high as possible on the VC side right. and the PE side is supposed to buy the best value. So how does, <laughs> how do they play together? No, 100% agree. And this is where uh, our valuation model, what we are putting it over there, is based on how we go and do the transfer pricing. Okay. And the valuation which has been agreed with respect to VC is reasonable, which is right valuation. Of course, as much as we can give it to them, but not like out of ordinary or like skyrocketing. If it is 10x, it is 10x from a valuation standpoint. And how internal price transfer we can do as a part of a position that everyone is fair with respect to the valuation we are getting from a PE standpoint and the founders are getting when they are doing the exit or they are captable investors, they are getting the right value as well. It is extremely important for us, for any companies which are moving in that price transfer range or the mechanism which we are trying to set, that we have spent enough time with them and hence, that is very, very important for us to spend at least three, four years with those founders and the company right from C till they get to Series B uh, when we make that decision to go and acquire it. So investing the time, and I think I mentioned, investing the time with the companies even before they are ready for pre-Series A funding is very important for us as to what we go and give it to them. Uh, from a valuation standpoint and eventually acquisition standpoint uh, at a later point in the stage of the uh, company. Yeah. So for maybe for new companies out there mm -hmm. who really don't understand maybe even what we're talking about, let, sure. let's, let's, let's break down what the VC model, right? So inside the VC model, you have the GP mm -hmm. and you have the LP, right? Yep. And then they find, so general partner, limited partner, general partners are people like you who run the operations, who are advising, coaching, mentoring these companies, scouting for the deals. It's a lot of work to be done. And then the LPs are the external people investing capital, rather than mm -hmm. ranging from angels to institutionals, right? Putting money in. Mm -hmm. So for a founder out there who's looking on the VC side and they're coming to you, what do mm -hmm. you look for in a company before you open up your wallet and invest in the company? What do you look for? So there are two, three criteria which we definitely look for. And we have a very robust rubrics and framework which we have put together, whether we'll be investing in that company or not. But three key things, the founders, who we would like to work with and who are coachable or not, and whether they fit within our criteria of uh, making the investment in. Two is about the product market fit, absolutely important. And three, products are product, but are those products or the companies have mastered their unit economics or not? Because capital can give you so much of runway, but at the same time, when it comes to scale, the unit economics needs to be mastered at an early stage. So these are the three criteria which we look at it, the founders, product market fit, and the unit, unit economics being, to an extent, being solved for, so that once we put our money in, it can be scaled. Money cannot scale it unless you fix that uh, or address the unit economics. It's that simple as that. Yeah. Out of those three, it seems as though unit economics is the easiest to, to measure because you yes. can say, what's the cost of acquisition of a client? What's the lifetime value of a client? And you could kind of, that could be easily on a spreadsheet. Product market fit could be a challenge to 
to measure? How do you go about measuring that? Right. Uh, and this is where we spend a lot of time doing the research about the product and the capabilities which these product has to offer. We don't, uh, like as a part of our research, before we even we start talking to the founders, like we do a lot of research with respect to the cap at a capability of that product level, not necessarily as a group of the product. Like our philosophy always is that um, the sum of all things put together is higher than the uh, individual capability they bring it in. Because for us, knowing all these capabilities and what the competition is for these capabilities which exist in the ecosystem, and when they are combined, what value they generate. That's where we spend at least four to five weeks with respect to just understanding that entire landscape for that product before we make our decision even to go and talk to the founders. Uh, so that's where our due diligence process and pre-due diligence process typically takes roughly four to six weeks to get completed. Uh, it, Maybe it's slightly longer for people, uh, some of the people, and I can totally understand that. But if we need to meet our fund mandate, which we have put together and what the claims we are putting in, we need to spend that time. And if those are not there, we are willing to work with those founders as well. And this is where coaching part comes into the picture. Hey, is, uh, is the founder ready to listen to us? Because we bring a lot of those uh, capabilities where we have launched and scaled the product and the companies in the past and some of the operators which we have, if they're ready to work with us for like for a month or two from a consulting strategy discussion and what that future roadmap from a pivoting standpoint can look like, we will we want to work with them. And once we agree to what that roadmap for the next five years, three to four years is going to look like, I think that's the point where we decide like, hey, we are ready to sign that check. And this all capability of working with them, uh, coaching them and coming up to a strategy comes along as a part of our investment thesis uh, and investment offering which we go and do uh, when we write that check with them. Yeah, so for founders out there who are in need of capital and we need it now, they, they have to learn the due diligence process and the intake process of a VC group. So they're not going to knock on your door, have a conversation, get checked next day, right? It's not, it's not it's a payday. Not going to happen. I mean, uh, unfortunately, that's not the case it's going to happen further from a founder standpoint. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, the time we are spending is for the good of the founder itself and yeah. good for the LPs we are working with and good for the company, which we would like to work with and take them to scale. Yeah. So next day funding, uh, we are not for that. For yeah, sure. this this is not a, a payday loan company, right? Like, nope. and no, I, I, I think it's healthy for founders to hear this conversation from a from a VC's mouth is is it takes time to do due diligence, to examine yes. the team, to do your own research, because there might be an industry that you have to learn some of the aspects of it, even even within the healthcare umbrella. There's so many yeah. different things that you just don't know. Yeah, healthcare is complex let alone two different countries have two different models of doing the healthcare. And as you rightly mentioned, every vertical within that, be it the oncology or clinical uh, trial phase or companies and so on and so forth, they have their own different value chain with respect to what the business process they go through. And that requires some time to be spent with the team and with the process and everything else. Yeah. All right. So we, we, we've covered unit economics, right? It's, that's a mathematical formula. We could do Excel spreadsheets. Now we talk about product market fit. That takes a little bit more time. Now, when it comes to the founders, there's things that you could do that, you know, you could do your background research. Are they criminal or not? You can look at their LinkedIn. You can look at their resume. You could see what they've done. You can look at their history, but there's a certain aspect to a, a founder. You're sitting across from a founder and there's a gut instinct. Talk to us yeah. about Talk to us about what you look for in a founder that might not be on their resume or LinkedIn. Conviction is the key. You said gut instinct, conviction, and the passion of that founder, how he explain and how deeply he understand his own business, what he's running in, from both breadth and the depth of it. We can identify and measure that within one, one and a half hours of conversation spending time with them in person and that in person can be like conversation like this online or preferably in person sitting within the room itself so uh 
that conviction of that founder within hour, hour and a half of conversation is something we'll be able to actually figure that out. You cannot find that conviction and killer instinct to do anything required for this company to be successful in all legitimate sense for sure um, is what we are looking for, right? right? Everything is on the line right now. Uh, we are not, not saying that the founder needs to go broke and whatnot, but at the same time, founder is, this is what they are living and breathing as we speak. It's not that they are doing some part-time job somewhere else and whatnot. So this is the only focus area uh, which they are doing. And sometimes actually more than what I want it to be, there are founders who have built, have great ideas about a system, what they're trying, or product which they're trying to build to, but they have too many variations of that idea which they would like to invest in. And this is where also we go and coach them that, hey, great ideas, we need to materialize one first. So having that total um, focus towards that, I think that is what is what we look for um, as we work with those founders. And you cannot find that in uh, decks or uh, pitches or LinkedIn, so to say, as yeah. we work through. What is a red flag? Right. If you're you and I are meeting together, my unit economics are great. I've got product market fit, like like I'm doing great job. But you're meeting with me, and then you just have this you you have this like alert that pops up in your head. What are some things that 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 come up in your head that you look for that might not be on the paper that you would say is a deal breaker for you sitting across from an, uh, a founder? Uh, there are a few red flags, uh, like indicator one. Um, and I have shared this thing with uh, some of my founders and companies which I've worked with as well. Uh, one is a lot of these founders who talks in, uh, not on the facts, but on the superlatives. So you can easily find out, find out uh, for lack of a better word, clear that like you can sense the BS. So uh, if the more you are closer to a simple English non-superlative language explaining the concept to me as to what the product is, what you're working in, and how this will make the money going forward or what's your business model to it. Uh, if people are not closer to simple English explaining that problem, I think that is the biggest red flag. And I've seen many, many pictures where they just don't explain what they're trying to do. If they're not able to explain it to me, a person who is spend 20 plus years in technology and consulting, then I think there is a, uh, something which requires tweaking and uh, working together as a collaborative person mm -hmm. to see how we can refine that tuning and so on and so forth. So I think that is the biggest thing uh, we look at it is to, if the person is genuine enough with respect to explaining what they're trying to do, um, and if, if that is not the case, then at least we'll share that feedback in a subtle way, uh, if not in the conversation, but later as well. So, What is the number one attribute that you think when you're looking at a founder, the number one attribute that you're looking through and you're like, man, this person's going to be a winner because of <laughs> this skill set or this character trait? What is that for you in your mind? Sure. So the two, three um, investments which we have done thus far, what we have looked for is their skill set in the background and two, whether they have done it in the past. And even if something which was not even related to what they have done in the past, like one of the companies which we are investing in, this person have taken a company IPO in a totally different domain, but he is working right now in um, agriculture technology. Total difference. But at the same time, the dedication and the focus and the understanding of the business, business model in the domain is so clear in that CEO. What makes me drive that, hey, this is the person who's going to be the winner. Yeah, I think combination of those two, three things uh, gives me an idea about who, where we are going to put our money on. Yeah. All right. So you're going to have to walk me through something because I'm ignorant. Sure. Okay. And I'm and I and I want to ask these questions that are sometimes tough because I think mm -hmm. it's important for myself to learn, but also our audience to to get in on how how I'm thinking and, and how we're going to process this. All right. So sure. investing in the in the U.S. I I get the U.S. I was born here, grew up here. I get it. I get uh -huh. the 
the language, I get the methodology, I get the economic, I, I get it for the most part, right? In India, I have no clue. I have no clue the culture, except the, my, my close friends that are Indian. But I, I have very, I'm, I'm not aware of investing internationally. And mm -hmm. I have no clue the opportunities. So walk me through how you approach that because mm -hmm. there's a lot of things like that. I'm, uh, I'm so unaware of what, how to, how to even invest over there, what to look for, what to look out for, right? So maybe you can uncover the opportunity that I might be missing and, sure. and uncover that for me. No, happy to. And I think um, Southeast Asian countries, as we speak today, most of it right now, including India and India predominantly, are in its growth phase right now with respect to the private investment as we speak. Uh, the current federal government uh, and most of the state governments which are there today, they have built up policies which invite foreign direct investments and they are favorable so much right now in favor of these private investors that uh, if you are cognizant about uh, doing your due diligence uh, effectively, 95% of the chance a majority of the case, you will end up having a return more than what you have expected it to be. Uh, say if you're setting up your goals, like, hey, can I have like 25% of IRR? You may end up having like 30%, 32% of IRR, which is great uh, with respect to what you're going to go and invest in. That being said, how will you identify as the question which you have said, like how will you identify what the process looks like? What are the things which you should take care of as you're investing in? Um, and this is where firms like us who are closely connected with uh, India uh, and known for its culture mm -hmm. and the people who we have or the ecosystem which we have built in, uh, within our uh, firm as to tap into some of those C-suite executives who have been their build their career, just launching the brands, scaling the companies and so on and so forth. Uh, having network of accounting professional or investment professionals out there in India who have done this kind of uh, work day in, day out and having a legal framework with respect to money going in is important. Money coming out is equally important so that you don't have some of those uh, issues uh, where you can uh, get caught off guard with respect to taxation, capital tax, gains and whatnot, because all that sums up when you do an exit, uh, all goes through what is your net carry come out to, to, to be and the value which LP gets or value which GP gets is important to know. And this is where we shine a lot. Like we have mastered that entire process working with the, the CPAs who are there in India, with the C-suite executives who are ready to help from an operating standpoint, and the legal entities which we have worked. These are three-legged tool of component, your financial, your legal, and then your operations in, in play, who knows the culture and the entire supply chain, what is needed to make a business successful are the key. And the two things which actually, uh, an intersection of all this also is very important, like, uh, some of the sectors which we are investing in right now uh, have a direct 100% FDI, which is there like space and others. But money going in, coming out, when you do an exit after two years, you there are tax implications. So how you set your entity up in India, how you make your investments in India in those entities are some of the smaller nuances uh, investors need to think through. And uh, we are, at least today, I can confidently say we have mastered the entire process as to how that will happen so that uh, all our LPs, including myself as a GP, we get the maximum return uh, on the investment we are making with the lesser or the minimum amount of taxation we need to pay within the entire regulations uh, or the policy framework which we have within India and US, uh, which is established. I think those are three things or a few things which needs to be considered as we make those investments. You got it. So when you're looking here, you're also mm -hmm. looking over in India. So you, you've got a bunch of different time zones. Right now, as we're interviewing this, this is, it's 2.30 Eastern. It's 1.30 yep. where you're at in Chicago, right? 
Yep. Over in India, what time is it right now? Uh, right now it's like uh, midnight. Midnight? Midnight, yes. All right. How do you balance time zone differences? Uh, mm -hmm. I remember one time I was selling to uh, from East Coast to West Coast and then to Europe. So I was sleeping under my desk doing, you know, back in the day. I'm, I'm telling you, man, it's tough to do. How do you manage the multiple time zones? Um, throughout my consulting career, right, uh, I have worked in multiple geographies. I've been part, start of my career, I was in India working with source Salon. Most of my clients were in US or some in Europe. And then when I moved here to US, I was on the client facing side and working with the team in India. So consultant, I mean, this is one of those things, consultant, this is in the DNA of the consultants to work in, uh, they they look at the work, not the time. I think that is an analogy we take uh, from that. Uh, so ch managing that time, managing that balance and time zones, I think that comes just natural to us. I, I don't see there is a reason. So at least I'm available to talk to my partners in India and partners in the US whenever they want me to be there and I meet where they want me to meet. So th that's not been a problem, but yeah. from a mechanic standpoint, uh, we have some of, some of our regular cadence with our operating partners uh, on a weekly basis so that uh, we learn what is happening on the ground uh, and we can I can share what is happening from our end to them and then we can collaborate. And also one of the things which we have established, like um, I'm traveling to India every three months uh, to spend like three, four weeks uh, at stretch with our companies, our partners, learn more about it and more meet more people. So I, I think that is a combination of logistics which we are taking through. How, how far of a flight is it? Uh, um, from Chicago to New, uh, to Delhi is uh, door to door. You can say it's roughly between 20, 22 hours of a flight or travel dur duration. Which That's is, a long flight. It's a long flight. Yes. <laughs> what, what language do you dream in? What language do you dream in today? Yeah. When you, when you, when you dream, do you, what language do you dream in? So these days, I'm just dreaming in numbers, man. <laughs> and numbers, which is universal, everyone can understand right now. That's a great answer, man. That's a great answer. I, I speak to my friends who are, you know, uh, speak multiple languages, and I always mm -hmm. am curious as to what they, they dream in. You dream in numbers. Excel spreadsheets At this point, numbers. That, that's what it is. I dream in numbers right now, yeah. which everyone can understand and easy to explain. So how'd you come up with the name of the company? Walk us through uh, what the name of the company is and how'd you come up with that? Sure, I mean, uh, given that um, it's a journey uh, which I have embarked on uh, to build a company which can make social and impact over there. And venture which I wanted to do that venture and ecosystem to be built. So the way the mm -hmm combination of words, the name of the word uh, company came in is company, which is trying to do a venture and it's a journey. So in, in French is in, in transit, in, in journey, in progress. So in venture is the two syllables which has been put together to provide that it's a journey, which, or which we are taking, um, to come up with the same. Yeah, I like it. Uh, for people listening in, uh, it's e n v e n t u r e dot i o. That's a good place for them to connect with you. Um, as you're building this out, you know mm -hmm. what would uh, what stage are you at as a VC group, and where do you see yourself heading? Because you got a unique model, I like it. But tell us where you're at right now. So um, we have a we. We'll, we are in a process of um, solidifying our deal flow as we speak, where, as we are working through it. So thus far, we have close to $60 million of, dollar, $60 million of deals which are ready to deploy across the cool. US and India. And 40, 45 million is something which we'll be able to finalize um, by Q, early Q1 of 2025. So, between now and say early Q1, we'll be at $100 million of deals ready to be deployed, working with uh, those founders. And one of the terms which we typically use for those is like, 
hey, can we influence or navigate the decision making with the founders? Mm -hmm. or do you, do you, so we have direct access to these uh, founders as we speak, and they are waiting for our capital to be deployed. And we are working with within our ecosystem uh, to make sure that we have uh, capital available to get this thing deployed. Um, so we are in in, in the, that process as we work through. Yeah. Before you became a VC, you were in mm -hmm. management consulting, did it for more than 20 years. Mm -hmm. What is the difference between the, the mindset of a consultant and what your the mindset of a, a venture capitalist? What is the different mindset? It's a, it's a good question. And this is, as you said, what is the mindset of this thing? Uh, what is the difference between consultant and a PE and a VC thing? The way I think and what I have realized working through is this, when you are a consultant, you are always thinking, and for all right reasons, these are the ways what I'm suggesting or recommending will work. As a P and a VC, at least the way my mindset or hat is, why this will not work, how it will fail, if I get the answer for how it will fail and the mitigation around it, mm -hmm. that's a good deal to make an investment in. Yeah. So that's the biggest difference for me personally, having lived on both sides of it. Yeah. Securing what it is going to be. One is, of course, positive with thinking like how I this will work, how this will fail, and for all right reasons. Uh, that's the mindset which we are thinking of. When you're managing someone else's money, yes, the consultant thinks, oh, we can make it work and here's how we can do it. And this is the opportunity and the growth. But if you're looking at 100 companies with that mindset, you're going to make 100 bets. Whereas a, uh, the VC has to go sift through 100. Let's choose maybe one, two, five, maybe 10 of those, right? So that is one, one way definitely what we are thinking. And also the second thing, what goes in that thinking mindset is when you're a consultant, good or bad, that's not your money. Yeah. On a PE and a VC side, that's the money I own. Though I manage someone else's money, but that is the money I own, which I need to go in return on which my success is going to be driven on. So where I'm putting even that single dollar is very important. And that's why I, I think uh, you also mentioned like how we go and prioritize about it, what that five bets I'm going to make on those frameworks which we have put together so that I can return 5x or 10x on that dollar being invested. Mm -hmm. So so that's the key of thinking uh, what we're looking at it or we look at right now. Even the interns and the associates we have, they come up with like, hey, Ankit, this will work. And why this will work? I say, okay, tell me five reasons it will not work. And then we have a very spirited discussion internally, like, okay, prove that to me. And they will go back and say, hey, this is the way this will fail. But these are the steps. If we take on that acquisition, we will be able to meet the target which we are putting in. So there's a lot of rigor mm -hmm. we are putting in our process to make sure that we, there are no knowns, like the unknown unknowns. There, there's so much we can plan about it, but we can run a lot of scenarios on those uh, cases when we go and do the discussion to, before we say, hey, we are ready to sign the check. Got it. So you, you've mentioned this earlier, and I've really enjoyed our conversation. Uh, and it's been a long time coming, man. We have got interrupted with a hurricane here in Florida. Travels have. I mean, I am so thankful for your grace and for your patience. But uh, let me ask this, for, for people listening in, give us the criteria, some of the criteria in industries and sectors that you look for. So if they're a good fit, they can reach out to you. They got their website and they got all your contact information in the show notes. What are some criteria sectors, maybe ranges of, of sizes of companies for your buy box? No, absolutely. So from a, let's start with the private equity on the acquisition side of it. Uh, we are looking for companies which are in healthcare as we speak uh, in the lower middle market and who have the revenue of say eight to $9 million as we speak. And from our side, we are looking to make an investment or ticket size of five to $15 million 
uh, to be invested per company. Um, and in some exceptional cases, that money, like the amount can go up and down, but we are looking for uh, to make an investment of like so roughly between six to eight companies across US and India mm-hmm. with the $100 million fund, which we have launched on the private equity side of it. Okay. Um, as that being said, on the venture side of it, we are looking at three industries today, which are interrelated, what we think. And it has a lot of potential as we go forward, uh, coming, bring those things together of space, sustainability, and healthcare. And uh, we are looking to uh, make an investment in the stages of pre-series A to series B. And I think we have covered as a part of our uh, conversation earlier is that we are ready to work with the founders or the companies before and after our segment of investment so that they are ready and workable. And the typical ticket size which we're looking to sign for them is 250K to $5 million uh, in in that ecosystem um, so that we can work with them uh, and help them grow. How in the world does space connect into this? I I get healthcare, I I get sustainability. Where in the world does space come in? Sure, Uh, I'll take a couple of examples. I think that will give you a good idea about how space is so very critical to the thesis which we have put together. Okay. So today, what is the biggest thing which people are talking about? Is AI. Elon Musk and SpaceX and of course. Sure, space is fine, but it, artificial intelligence, right? Yeah. We are talking about NVIDIA, generative AI and whatnot. What is the biggest, that's great. It's like we are looking forward for it, like the target. Now, what is the biggest problem with the AI running all this uh, computing needs is mm-hmm. the emission of greenhouse, uh, right? So GHG, when you talk about green, greenhouse emission, that means your data centers where these computing powers or computing servers are running on needs to be, have some kind of a sustainable model of mm-hmm. running and managing the system. So there, there is so much you can do with respect to while you are being on earth. There is a possibility of having, and at least we are having in conversation with few of those, having these data center being deployed in space. Really? So which brings the intersection of a space and sustainability together? So that's one intersection as to why this is related. Second yeah. intersection is about um, life sciences and bio uh, Mm -hmm. drugs capability. People have started talking about uh, living longer and wellness and whatnot. How are you going to test that the medicine or vitamins which you're building for reversing the age and whatnot is effective enough in space once Mm -hmm. you have your astronaut, cosmonaut and any variation of people or human being there, what we have observed, at least to my knowledge, that people age faster in the US, uh, in the space as we speak. And we have like almost 50 plus years of data available on those biomarkers. So you can test a lot of these biomedicines uh, and this is where healthcare comes into the ecosystem as to space healthcare ecosystem how Mm. they can help the health sciences, right? There are cases, and and there are two or three cases also we we are talking to some of the companies as well, where there's an intersection of sustainability, space, and healthcare all together. The foundation of all the three capabilities or sectors which we have chosen is the data and the computing. Mm -hmm. And all that come, the foundation remains the same. The use cases vary a bit. But these are the two examples, at least I can give it to you, like to how the space comes into the play. And space is going to play a huge role when we talk about the healthcare and innovations, what can happen and so on and so forth, uh, both in the healthcare ecosystem and on the sustainability side of it. Because data collection through the orbit will give you how much green you have on the earth mm-hmm. and so that you can take some of those decisions uh, around it uh, to say plant or take some of those uh, measures which is required to control the pollution, CO2 or PM 
markers which we are uh, measuring. So, so I think those are important intersection and that gives us a unique edge with respect to our team, which is there, mm -hmm. which comprises of uh, some of the best of the brains from NASA as we speak, uh, best of the brains from government policy around healthcare sustainability space talking about it best of the brain from sustainability coming in, who has been like 15, 16 years in their career in sustainability. Mm -hmm. uh, that gives me a confidence that our intersection, the company or the sectors which we have chosen uh, for our thesis is something which is phenomenal uh, and will pay off the investments we are going to do um, in, 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 in coming days uh, over there. Yeah. So as you're, as you're building stuff, that will one day maybe be in space. This is so exciting. I, I love hearing this. I've, I've heard this before about the, the testing in space based on the uh, e effectiveness of the medication, the, the, the right. speed of how things are done, the mm -hmm. efficacy, I think is another term that I've heard, but like super interesting. Thanks for bringing that up. I never would have connected those dots to why mm -hmm. do things. Mm -hmm. um, if, if people listening in the audience maybe fit that model of uh, a founder that would like to have a conversation with you, or maybe someone who's interested in having a conversation about being a part of what you guys are building, where can people go to connect with you and uh, learn more? No, I think the best way to connect is definitely through LinkedIn. Um, it has all my details with respect to my email, um, email IDs, uh, phone numbers, where people can reach out, or through our website also. Uh, which has the email ID and the phone numbers, what's needed um, to reach us. And just for your audience over here, uh, the best way they can drop a note is ankit at adventure.io, uh, which is our email ID. And the phone number, of course, is 312-576-0193, where they can text or call me and we can set up a call. Very cool. Fellow deal makers, as always, reach out to our guests. Say thanks for being on the show and sharing this information. This has been a fun conversation about space and private equity and venture capital, the different business models, what people look for before making an investment. So uh, I encourage you to go back and listen and, and reach out to our guests and, and say thanks for being on the show. Now, if you have a deal that you'd like to talk about here on the show, head on over to thedealscout.com, fill out a quick form, and maybe get you on the show next. Till then, we'll talk to you all on the next episode. See everybody.